Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mormon News Weekly. This new weekly show is dedicated to a roundtable discussion of the latest news in the broad world of Mormonism. Each episode will dissect the previous week's top Mormon-related news stories from our very different perspectives. So that it's not all serious all the time, we'll also throw in a few fun stories and pop culture musings along the way. My name is Patrick Mason. I'll be moderating the conversation this week with my two fellow panelists, Jana Reese and John DeLynn. We'll rotate with a different one of us directing traffic each week. Now, in terms of our day jobs, I'm a professor of religious studies and history at Utah State University. Jana is a senior columnist at Religion News Service, and John is host of the Mormon Stories podcast. John and Jana, welcome. It's great to see you. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. This is super exciting. Yeah. Hey, so what else do you want to each say about yourselves here uh, to introduce yourself to our listeners? Well, I'll start. So I am a senior columnist for Religion News Service, and I'm also the author of the book, The Next Mormons, How Millennials Are Changing the LDS Church. I'm currently at work on a project about people who have left Mormonism and what their lives look like now. Awesome. John? I think uh, I'll say I'm president of the Patrick Mason and Jennerys fan clubs. I'll start by saying <laughs> that. Then, uh, no, I'm a I, uh, sixth generation Mormon, raised in the church, uh, did a tech career before I um, started my podcast, Mormon Stories, to help talk about difficult things in Mormonism, and uh, ended up getting a PhD in clinical and counseling psychology along the way, researched uh, mental health and Mormonism, including the LGBTQ Mormon experience. And uh, at some point, my my membership uh, kind of uh, was challenged a bit, and I was excommunicated from the church. But I remain someone who self-identifies as a Mormon, who loves uh, the Mormon people, and just loves talking about Mormonism. Awesome. Thanks. And uh, yeah, in addition to, to being a professor, so I, I uh, write uh, I write books both for the, the academy. Uh, people generally don't read those books, uh, my scholarly ones. And then I've written some books uh, that are directed a little bit more at, at church audiences. And, um, and so I'm, I'm fully invested in and, and participating in, in the church in addition to my academic work. And so I'm excited for, for what we're going to do here uh, on, on this show. And before we dive in and start doing our work, uh, talking about the week's stories, I think it's important, especially in this first episode, for us to talk about why we created this show in the first place. There's definitely no shortage of podcasts and websites and chat rooms and blogs and, and periodicals dedicated to talking about Mormonism. So why in the world does the world need another one? John, John, what do you think? We've we've been talking about this for a little while now. Yeah, well, from my point of view, there's a lot of heat, but not enough light. And whether it's religious discourse or political discourse, I I am frustrated with the level of polarization and contention in society, which which some may even think of me personally as a source for that. But I would love to join in an effort to try and reduce polarization and model healthy discourse within Mormonism and religion in general. Um, and, and so that's what I'm hoping to do. Yeah, that's definitely what brought me in. What, what attracted me to this vision too is, is, is there a way that we can talk about difficult things, right? And religion is one of the most difficult things for, for people to talk about, but to do it in a way that, that clearly we're going to disagree about some things along the ways. We might disagree about a lot of things, but in a way that, that models a kind of healthy, dialogue, a kind of civility, a generosity towards one another positions and listening as, as much as speaking. Jana, what about you? Yeah, I'm excited to be part of this. Um, so Patrick is fully invested in the church. John says he grew up Mormon and has uh, no is still identifying as Mormon himself, but has no ties to the official church in terms of membership. I am uh, an active member. I have both a ward calling and a state calling right now, but I'm not always terrifically orthodox. And sometimes in my columns for religion news service, I'm you know, taking things on in what I hope is an honest way. Sometimes it is perceived as a, a challenge to the church and that's not my intent. 
but I am trying to engage in open conversations about difficult topics. And so when the opportunity to be part of this conversation came along, I was really intrigued and excited to be part of it. Terrific. Well, let's get into it. Let's let's see how this actually works. So, uh, uh, so the first story we're going to talk about each week, we're going to try and talk about multiple stories, wh- whatever the top headlines are uh, that week. And, and again, maybe some some fun things. Uh, so we're launching this show in the week after the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints held its 193rd annual general conference. So this is a weekend when members of the church from around the world gather to listen to what the, the leaders of the church have to say to them. Uh, and so there's 10 hours of material, five two-hour sessions, plenty to talk about there, more than, than we have time to talk about here. But um, I think for most members of the church, it's probably fair to say that the highlight of General Conference is when the president of the church speaks. And, and this, is, this is a man that members of the church regard as a, as a prophet of God. And, and I think it's fair to say that in this General Conference, uh, it did not disappoint in, in that regard. Uh, president Russell M. Nelson gave what I thought was an epic address uh, in the Sunday morning session of, of General Conference. The talk was called Peacemakers Needed. And, and I want to set this up uh, with, we have a little clip here where he describes, he, he essentially addresses a problem that he sees in society and, and in the church, and then he goes on to address it. So, so let's, uh, let's hear from President Nelson. Civility and decency seem to have disappeared during this era of polarization and passionate disagreements. Okay, so so he's identified the the same kind of thing that, that, that we're talking about here in terms of why we've launched that show, and and let's play just one more clip. I think kind of a money line in terms of of how President Nelson suggests that we address this incivility and the polarization that we see. The Savior's message is clear: His true disciples build, lift, encourage persuade and inspire, no matter how difficult the situation. True disciples of Jesus Christ are peacemakers. So true disciples of Jesus Christ are peacemakers. Jana, as, as you heard this talk, as you've thought about it, um, what's gone through your mind? I think this, is, this talk was outstanding. And I think it's going to be a signature talk as President Nelson is remembered, remembered in years to come as one of the best talks that he has ever given. And certainly it has a timelessness about it that is wonderful. It will be as appealing to Latter-day Saints half a century from now as it is to Latter-day Saints today, which I think is not true of every single general conference talk. That timelessness is pretty important. And yet it is also very timely because as he says, we are in this age of terrible polarization of really unprecedented in American life anyway, even though he's speaking to a global church community, um, a lot of these divisions we're seeing in the US, but we're also seeing elsewhere in the world and certainly where there is war. And so the idea that every Latter-day Saint needs to be a peacemaker within our own jurisdiction and within our own stewardship is so important. Yeah, you think about the places where the church is is still growing and, and is strong, places like Brazil, like but the Philippines, like West Africa. Th- these are places with a lot of political conflicts in addition to the, um, so this isn't just a U.S. context, it's very much global. Uh, John, what did you hear as, as you listened to this? I mean, I think this is Christianity and Mormonism at its best and Russell M. Nelson at its best. When I think of Christ, I think of, I, I think of the title of the Prince of Peace. And so anytime we're proclaiming peace right now, I'm uh, I'm thrilled and elated, especially as we've all decried just the polarization and animosity that, that is so prevalent today. Um, <clears throat> if, if I'm ca- talking about the constituency that sometimes I communicate with a lot, which is kind of people who are questioning or or even disaffiliated with the church, there was a there was a lot of discussion about things like uh, President Jeffrey R. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland's talk from BYU, you know, let's just say a year ago where he talked about musket fire, um, a, a talk where I know that his intent was not to be divisive or to 
to be polarizing. But at the same time, because he used a, a military or a weaponry reference, and because it was connected to the LGBT, a very polarizing topic, you know, some even wondered whether Russell M. Nelson was sort of trying to send a message publicly or even maybe a censure to Jeffrey R. Holland, which is clearly speculative. But I think, in the, you know, there have been people who in my community have, have sort of said sometimes maybe we could hear more from general authorities about peacemaking and less divisive rhetoric. So, that, you know, those are some of the questions that the people that I talked to, um, you know, brought up after, after hearing about this talk. Yeah, I, I I have to say, I mean, I I was just thrilled because it wasn't just President Nelson's talk. Actually, peacemaking and and charity and reaching out to other people, bridge building, this was a consistent theme uh, throughout conference. That there seems you know to to have been a concerted effort to talk along these lines. And I would just love. I mean, nothing would please me more than for Latter Day Saints to get the memo. Right. For, for, for us to, to, to really follow the prophet on this one and to be known and to be recognized as, as a people of peace. Um, I'm going to just jump in here and say that Patrick yeah. is the author of a book that just came out called Proclaim Peace. Patrick, you, you st- said that nobody reads your academic books. That's not true because I read them and your church related books. But, you know, for people who are looking to go deeper within the LDS tradition and peacemaking and find the resources that are within the LDS tradition, that's a great place to look. Thanks, Jan. And well, you know, I, I, I have been thinking and writing and, and talking about these themes for several years now with my co-author, David Pulsifer. And and it's um, I have to say, like personally, like my experience listening to President Nelson it was, uh, I have to say, it was one of the more overwhelming spiritual and emotional experiences I've had listening to General Conference for a long time. Um, and so it was it was remarkable. That must have uh, felt really validating, Patrick, to hear something that I know you care about so passionately really being emphasized. That must have felt great. Yeah, but but for me, it's it's not about me. It was it was always about like this is the message, like you said, John. I mean, like you know, yeah. we you know, as, as, if we say we're Latter Day Saint Christians, we worship the Prince of Peace. So, so as as we think about this, another one of the themes in General Conference that we heard a lot this time, I, I think that that struck a lot of people was the idea of Palm Sunday. So the um, the General Conference happened on the weekend before Easter uh, this year. And, and so right out of the gates, Elder Stevenson, the very first speaker in general conference, uh, addressed this. Should we play a clip? Yeah. Okay. I observe a growing effort among Latter-day Saints towards a more Christ-centered Easter. This includes a greater and more thoughtful recognition of Palm Sunday and Good Friday as practiced by some of our Christian cousins. We might also adopt appropriate Christ-centered Easter traditions found in cultures and practices of countries worldwide. I'm I'm personally, I would love to hear background from Jana, you or Patrick about why this was striking to you, because I think it'd be really useful for me and others to hear. Yeah, this is something that I've been harping on for years, uh, that if we are truly a people who believe that Christ's resurrection is the most important thing in human history, we also need to pay attention to the things that led up to Christ's resurrection and not just pretend that he never died, which frankly, uh, in Mormon tradition seems to be the case because we celebrate Easter, but we never have observed Good Friday or Maundy Thursday or Palm Sunday or any of the other um, markers of Holy Week that Christians around the world are observing and have been doing for centuries. So for me, this was kind of my hallelujah moment. If the peacemaking talk was Patrick's hallelujah moment, this was really important for me. I'm married to an Episcopalian uh, on Palm Sunday. Actually, I was at an Episcopal church in the morning and then, you know, did general conference the rest of the day. And so for me, this was fantastic of hearing that this is important that observing all of Holy Week is important. And particularly, you know, it came up in that talk. It also came up in Ronald Rasband's talk. Um, he specifically references Palm Sunday, and he specifically references the palms of Jesus's hands and the suffering of Christ, which is very important. That's a huge part of the story. Yeah, for me, I loved his reference to, to our Christian cousins, uh, this this is um, and 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 also drawing from traditions and practices around the world, 
All right. And, and for me, that's, it's a, it's a really nice, it's sort of subtle, but it, but it, it's uh, for me, it pushes back against some of the aspects of, of the church that I kind of grew up with and inherited both the sense that like, Hey, we're not part of like Christianity, the rest of, of, uh, uh, you know, cause, cause we're special and because of this uh, kind of great apostasy narrative. So for us to be able to, to think about ourselves a little bit more explicitly as part of a broader Christian family tree, I find really attractive and meaningful. And then also just to say, like, it, it's a global church. There's Christians all over the world. Guess what? Americans and Utahns, maybe we have something to learn, uh, not just yes. something to export to the rest of the world, but, but maybe there are some practices out there that, that we can learn from. So I, that was really meaningful. Love it. Maybe I'll just maybe I'll just add finally that to the extent to which the church has kind of um, experienced some controversy or some even difficulty talking about its history or its truth claims or whatever, there's been this push to kind of de-emphasize, in my perception, de-emphasize maybe some of the more uniquely Mormon aspects of our past and of our current history and doctrine, and instead with President Russell and Nelson. To, to really put an emphasis on Jesus Christ, whether it's by, um, you know, putting Christ as central in the logo, changing the, you know, the name, the people, you know, the way that people refer to the church or to the members away from Mormon to Latter-day Saints or members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's people that I talk to who, who view that cynically or interpret that in kind of a, a cynical way. I, you know, in the spirit of bridge building, how can we not view it as anything but positive to see the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints turn their focus and their attention and their messaging towards the Savior, towards Jesus Christ? And I, I see that as only positive. And so um, as far as I'm concerned, more Jesus, more Savior, more good for all of us, um, including those who are no longer directly affiliated. That's what I feel. I love that. And I, I do see this as um, this is where I think these two things connect. Right. President Nelson's talk about peacemaking uh, and then what it, what it actually means to be a Christian. So, um, you know, so, so there were lots of wonderful messages uh, and, and we could keep talking about those. But General Conference always, you know, in 10 hours of material, there's always a few moments that, that give people a little bit of heartburn, um, a few things that, that don't sit as well. Uh, and, and so, uh, we wanted to bring up a, at least just one of those things. And we have, we have a clip and this, this is from a talk from Elder Ahmed Corbett, who was called as a general authority 70 in this general conference. Parents, if your child struggles with a gospel principle or prophetic teaching, please resist any type of evil speaking or activism toward the church or its leaders. These lesser secular approaches are beneath you and can be lethal to the long-term faithfulness of your child. So, John, what do you, uh, this is something we've talked about a little bit be before. What, um, what do you hear there? It's tough because I really applaud, you know, uh, Elder Corbett was just called as a general authority. We don't, you know, we don't have a lot of people of color, especially from the United States, in in the top church leadership. And so I even hesitate to want to make any commentary at all. Um, on the other hand, I guess there's two points that come to my mind. The first, to hear Elder Corbett kind of decry activism, when you think about the, the history within the United States, specifically in the civil rights movement, that kind of paved the way to maybe provide him and many others with opportunities that otherwise wouldn't be given in civil and religious society. It's a little bit strange to hear him decrying activism, even though he is specifically, you know, not talking about civic activism, but activism within the church. It's still a little bit off for me, but then um, maybe more significantly, and th this is something I want to hear from you, you, Patrick and Jana about. There's a degree to which I, I, I was always kind of taught growing up that if you do activism within the Mormon church, that uh, it's not going to yield positive results, that it'll just cause resistance or backlash amongst the leadership. But as I look um, at the past 15 or 20 years, especially with the rise of the internet and internet activism within Mormonism, I kind of feel like internet activism within Mormonism and or media coverage is kind of the, the most 
significant or meaningful or powerful way to actually affect change within the church, whether it's the church's discussion of history and truth claims, LGBTQ stuff uh, for women. So many, so much of the progress we've seen over the past 10, 15 years seems to be within Mormonism, the result of church-based activism. And that's, you know, that's why I kind of highlighted this clip to just ask the question, is that fair? Is that not fair? What do you, what do you all think? I think that the church needs to preserve the idea that it changes because the prophet gets a revelation and that it changes uh, really from the top down. But in reality, it's a dialectic, right, between change that comes from the top down and change that comes from the bottom up. And that is activism. Maybe it's sometimes a quiet activism. Maybe it's sometimes a young women president saying, no, we are not going to have that event where we're shaming girls that are showing their shoulders. You know, activism can take a lot of different forms within the church. Um, I would say, I think I greatly appreciate the pastoral sense of this talk that he is speaking from the context of counseling with families. You know, he used to be in the young men's presidency, right? So I'm sure that some of this is coming from that history. And he is seeing how how painful it can be for parents when their children are questioning or their children are leaving the church. I like the context of it. I think that uh, I, I would love to hear different wording. A lot of the objections are to that particular word about activism. We are supposed to be an activist people as Latter-day Saints, right, in the world and also within our own community. That doesn't stop when we come into the door of the church. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, there's, um, you know, specifically this was counsel he was given to, to uh, when parents are talking to their own children. And 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 I think the sense he's trying to give here is is one of loyalty to the church uh, and to its leaders of, of encouraging parents to lead with faith uh, rather than leading with with criticism and. Um, uh, there's no doubt that in the history of the church, there's been all kinds of activism, which has brought about lots of positive changes. Uh, I mean, that, that's that's just a historical fact. Um, so, so yeah, we, I, I, you know, we we might quibble with his word choice, but but I think in in the sense of like how how parents deal with their 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 children, um, there is some good pastoral advice here. But but I think there's also the other side of the coin: is what does it look like for parents to empower their children, let their children explore the world on their own? Um, and and not squelch those kinds of questions that their their kids might have to the point that actually that might be counterproductive. So it's it, I think it's a much bigger conversation about how we talk about these things. All right. So obviously we we could say so much more about General Conference. We could probably talk talk for ten hours about the ten hours of of General Conference. But we want to talk about one more story. And this this didn't happen this week per se, but it's been a big story that. That, that we wanted to, to discuss here, that in, in February of this year, uh, lots of news outlets reported that the Federal Securities and Exchange Commission charged Ensign Peak Advisors, which manages a multi-billion dollar portfolio for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, a multi-million dollar fine for obscuring the church's investments and misstating Ensign Peak's control over those investment decisions. So there was a $4 million penalty that Ensign Peak had to pay. The church paid an additional $1 million penalty and admitted regret for uh, mistakes uh, that had been made. Um, and so, uh, so in the back, with all that in the background, there was also this the, uh, a report that's given every year in general conference from the church's auditor uh, that I think some people it it uh, it maybe struck them as sounding a little funny this year. So let's play that clip. Based upon audits performed, church auditing is of the opinion that in all material respects, contributions received, expenditures made, and assets of the church for the year 2022 have been recorded and administered in accordance with church approved budgets, accounting practices and policies. Well, I have to say so I mean, you know, this this world of high flying finance is is just so far beyond me. I uh, I think it's pretty clear that that this is a case with the SEC where you know, the church is just a vast multinational, you know, there's a, there's a corporate aspect to it. Uh, managing, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of assets. So clearly, there's 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 lawyers and financial managers doing a lot of this work, and then giving advice to the first presidency. I think this is a case where they gave bad bad advice. 
This is probably a case of of guys, and it's probably mostly guys, you know, with fancy MBAs who have worked for Goldman Sachs and other kinds of things who have learned how to go right up to the line of legality. And I think they probably bought, brought those practices back when they got hired for the church. So I think, um, you know, I, I think this is a really regrettable moment. Now, that auditing statement, maybe that has to do with internal processes. I mean, it, the fact that, that they didn't address it at all and then gave that statement straight faced, um, you know, I, I, I think it fell, uh, felt, felt a little funny uh, to a lot of people who were listening. Jana, what do you, what do you think? Yes, I agree. And for the people who care about this issue, which I would say is a small but vocal minority of Latter-day Saints, uh, that was a problem. And it's you might be able to dismiss it and say, well, why would the global auditing report be influenced by something that's happening only in the United States, where the, the church had to pay a $5 million fine because of the way it had hidden its different accounts and its finances? But it's also been happening, uh, similar problems have been happening in on Australia with the church and in Canada with the church. It's not just a United States issue. And I think we will be seeing this arise in the news in other nations as well. Yeah, what are you hearing, John? I, I look forward to the day to where the church can get up in general conference and just say something really simple like, hey, we messed up and uh, we're learning from it and we're gonna try and do better. One of the things I love most about my Mormon upbringing is the teachings that the church gave me, one of them being just how to repent, how to make things right. And uh, I think we're moving towards a day where the church will be willing to make a simple apology. And I just think what an amazing example, what an inspiring example that will set for the membership when the church uh, is able to model the the type of repentance that it that it taught us all. That's kind of what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I like that view. I think that's a really generous assessment. I, th- I think there's a, there's a lot to that. In the spirit of this podcast, there's some generosity. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, well, there's so much more to talk about. Uh, we're all good at talking, uh, but that's all the time we have for this episode of Mormon News Weekly. If this is the kind of conversation that you want to listen to and support, please subscribe and consider donating at mormonnews.com. John, Janet, it's it's been a pleasure. Uh, I I just can't wait uh, for for what's ahead for for these, these conversations. I look forward to next week. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Jana. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And check us out next week for the next installment of Mormon News Weekly.